practice, yeah. Good second part of the morning. So, are you awake? <laughs> How many of you computed yesterday the Lagrangian point two? <laughs> no. You, right? You, you, you computed. You both. <laughs> Anyways, so I start with this slide because uh, uh, right after lunch, Rasmus will give us a seminar in which he will explain better these corrections that we have to an effective, right? So, I mean, this, we stopped here yesterday. Uh, so, um, the effect of flavor oscillations is tiny. And uh, um, let's continue now with uh, neutrinos, okay? So in the early universe. So these neutrinos, as I explained you yesterday, don't inherit any of the, of the entropy released by electron positive annihilation. And therefore the temperature today is roughly 10 to the minus 40. If these neutrinos are massive, their energy density at temperatures much smaller than their mass, that is today, is given by the product of the mass times the number density. The number density is one thing we need to compute, which is this number. And then we obtain the relative contribution of neutrinos to the total mass energy density. That is the second thing you need to compute, okay? Is the exercise number one, is the exercise number two, okay? There will be a third one later on. This is quite easy. It's just unit, so I mean. So um, realize that uh, one can impose already a very, very uh, rough bound on their mass by demanding that these neutrinos don't overclose the universe, that is by demanding that omega nu is smaller than, should be smaller than or equal to one, one gets this bound, which is not very good, but it's a very straightforward one. It's very simple, right? So realize also that these neutrinos decouple from the thermal bath when the temperature of the universe was MEVs. And these neutrinos are very light. So they decouple when they were extremely relativistic. So for a one EV neutrino, the thermal motion is comparable to the typical velocity dispersion of a galaxy. Here I show you the, the penguin galaxy, okay? Here you can make your own penguin galaxy. I've done this with, with high, school, high school students. NASA has a program to build this nice thing. However, in the universe, there are also smaller objects, right? Like the dwarf galaxies, right? And the velocity dispersion for these objects is much, much, much smaller, like the large or small Magallanic clouds. Here, the velocity dispersion of each object is of the order of 10 kilometers per second. So this means that neutrinos have too much thermal energy to be squeezed into the very small volumes we observe today in our universe. And this is going to make them super different to polar matter, okay? Because they cannot cluster at a small scales because they, are, they have too much thermal energy. So they really don't cluster at, at, at given scale, at some scales, okay? So according to standard cosmology, there should be a background of neutrinos equivalent to the photon one. There are 340 neutrinos per centimeter cube. In American units will be like 6,000 neutrinos per inch cube, okay? So the, the thing is that this cosmic neutrino background that we believe that is permeating the universe has never been detected directly, okay? So the universe is filled with a flux of really neutrinos created in the Big Bang. And this makes neutrinos the most abundant known form of hot dark matter, okay? So we have discovered hot dark matter because these neutrinos should be there although they have never been detected directly, but only in, the, in, the, in, 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 our, in, our, in an indirect way. So we have seen this in, 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 in uh, the lectures of, of Joachim. So according to neutrino oscillation physics, there are these two dirac or Magellan neutrinos because the, the lightest one, could, the mass of the lightest state could be zero, okay? And because we have measured two different mass scales, the solar and the atmospheric mass, mass splitting. The, the design of the atmospheric mass splitting is not known. So we don't know if the hierarchy is normal here or is inverted, which will correspond that the solar doublet is the heaviest in mass, okay? So uh, this is what we know from neutrino oscillation physics. And uh, this meso meso neutrino oscillation physics, what they imply is that mm, we are sure that two neutrinos have a mass above the, the, solar, the solar mass splitting and that at least one of these neutrinos have a mass larger than 0.05 EV, okay? Mm -hmm. So what uh, happens is that the, the, the bounds of, or, or the measurements of, from, from oscillations serve or are used as a lower bound on the total mass of neutrinos, okay? So... Uh, this is translated, as is written here, into a lower bound of the total neutrino mass depending on the orbiting. So here I show you three plots, okay? The first one 
So the total neutrinomass are the mass of, of the mass of the lightest neutrino for the normal in red and for the blue, uh, for the inverted in blue with current constraints. Okay, you can see that current, we are going to see this much better later on, we, we, in much, much more detail, that current constraints, okay, are really, really approaching uh, really, really amazing sensitivities. This is CMB alone, we are going to see this, okay, and this is CMB plus large scale structure. So, here I show you the very same thing, okay, the, the, the bad versus the mass as measured by tritium beta decay experiments, as, as Catherine, for instance, okay? And here I show you the Catherine current sensitivity and the future one. And also I show you this, uh, this uh, the, 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 the sum of the neutrino masses again, right? But versus the, versus the, the, the mass as measured by neutrino is double beta decay experiments. And here I show you the timelines and current sensitivity and future sensitivities, sensitivities as the next experiment, okay? So, this I saw you already yesterday, neutrinos should contribute more than 0.1% according to neutrino oscillations and according to cosmology, less than 0.3%. But we don't know exactly what's the precise value. So let's now go much slower than yesterday and see how do we learn from the neutrino parameters from cosmology. Let's start with an effective, okay? So uh, let's go to the BBM period. We have seen uh, the neutrino decoupling period, electron positron annihilation, which hits the, the photon bath, but not the neutrino one. That's why neutrinos are colder than photons today. And then we are here in the first three minutes, okay, of the unit. Big bang nucleosynthesis, okay, when the first nuclei is formed, okay. So big bang nucleosynthesis uh, refers to the abundance of the lightest elements uh, in the universe. I mean, heavier than the than than the than the proton, okay? So deuterium, helium-3, and helium-4, and lithium-7, which are fixed by the first three minutes. So in order to measure uh, the, this, the, this uh, primordial abundances, we need to go to, to places with very, very uh, um, little evolution, right? Okay? So low, basically low metallicity size, right? So I mean, it's like if we would, would like to know how looks a person when she was a baby. If you look, if you, you take a look into the picture when this guy or this woman is 80 years old, you will never ever learn how was when a baby, how was it, or she or she when, when, when they were babies, right? So I mean, we really need to look into places with low metallicity size. So here I show you the abundances of helium-4, helium-3, deuterium, and lithium-7 as a function of the baryon density of the baryon uh, content of the universe or the baryon to photon ratio here, right? And you can see that these are the theoretical predictions, okay? Here, these lines. Here we have the CMB measurements of the baryon to photon ratio or of the baryon uh, density parameter. And these are the, uh, these yellow boxes are the measurements from, uh, from uh, astrophysical measurements. Okay, now I will, I will tell you uh, um, how are they measured. Uh, all of them agree perfectly except for the lithium one. In the case of the lithium-7, we have a problem there, it's the so-called lithium-7 problem. We don't know if it's a problem in extracting the, the primordial abundances or in computing, predicting the theoretical predictions in computing the precise lithium uh, abundance in the universe, okay? But there is a problem there. So, I mean, uh, let's start with helium-4. Helium-4 is, is measured in low metallicity extragalactic H2 regions, but it's producing stars, this is bad. Because, I mean, if it's produced, you are not sensitive to the primordial abundance. Uh, the imperium is measured in high uh, redshift, uh, quasi stellar objects in the absorption lines, but it's destroying a star. But helium-3 is not used for cosmological uh, constraints because it's only measured in, very, in, in places with, with, with uh, very, very high metallicity, okay? Uh, Lithium-7 is measured in metal pushes. In our galaxy, however, it's destroyed in, in stars and produced by, by cosmic ray interaction. So, I mean, at the end, uh, some of them have some drawbacks, but still, here I show you the, 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 the uncertainty in, uh, with which this, these elements have been measured, right? That is the fractional uncertainties in the light element abundance, right? And you can see that helium is very well measured, also, deuterium and lithium is badly measured, and moreover, we have this problem. So, let's continue with why we care about video. So, Let's, let's, let's see what happens. So basically, 
um, in the un when 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 uh, BBN takes uh, takes place around one MeV, right? The, the the universe is made of photons, electrons, and positrons, and neutrinos, which have the cathode. And also non relativistic uh, particles as baryons. So there are much less baryons than photons realized, right? The baryon to photon ratio is very, very small. Neutrons and protons interact via these weak interactions, okay? And light elements are formed via nuclear interactions, okay? So proton plus neutron, deuterium plus gamma, deuterium plus deuterium, helium 3, helium 3 plus deuterium, uh, proton plus helium 4. So I mean, the, the calculations are very tough, but normally one can assume that. No, no elements heavier than helium or lithium are formed, and also that at temperatures above 0.1 MeV, there are only three protons and electrons, okay? Because at higher temperatures, any times a nucleus is formed, then a high energy photon will be stored, okay? So, here is a busy plot, but no worries, because what, we, what I want to just to, to, to show you is that, again, we have here this, uh, the, the Boltzmann equation that we saw yesterday, okay? And we apply it to this equation, the neutron to proton ratio, okay? So at high temperatures, right here, this time goes this way, okay? So at high temperatures, there are as many protons as neutrons, and as temperature decreases, the neutron fraction, here I saw you the neutron, the neutron fraction right here, goes down, okay, you see? And then we start to form, uh, the first one that which forms is obviously the deuterium, we have also li uh, helium, right, four here, helium three, uh, lithium seven and beryllium. Okay, so I mean we can we can we can make very quite accurate calculations just assuming that deuterium starts to form at 0.07 and before there were no nuclei. Okay, so what do we care about this this neutron to proton ratio? This is very important. Okay, I explain you now why. Because what happens with an effective with the number of effective relativistic degrees of freedom or the number of of relativistic particles that are in the thermal bath at the BBM period, right, is that if, if it changes, it will change the freeze out uh, of, of weak interactions. Freeze out occurs in a, I mean, uh, one needs to compute the Boltzmann equation, but in a hand way, I mean, a real, as a rule of thumb, occurs when the thermal, when the thermal expansion rate, when the, sorry, when the thermal interaction is of the order of the Hubble parameter. So more neutrinos, let's imagine we have more neutrinos, will induce a larger expansion rate and therefore a, a larger freeze out temperature. So the neutron to proton ratio will be higher and we will get more helium four because the, the, helium, uh, the helium fraction is directly proportional to the neutron to proton ratio, okay? So for measuring an effective via BBN measurement, we don't care about the deuterium. The deuterium you see here, an effective four, three, and two. The deuterium is basically the same. We don't care about, uh, I mean, the deuterium does not give us any, any hint about uh, the, the an effective, nor lithium seven. And moreover, lithium seven, we have this problem that we don't understand, so better forget about it. But however, as you can see here, right, the helium fraction is very, very different, right, for the different uh, values of an effective. So how do we measure an effective from BBM? by the helium uh, abundance, okay? So let's go now to the combination, okay? There's the next uh, period in the universe, okay? Maybe I have gone too fast uh, in this slide, okay? So we are now, from the, from the first uh, three minutes in the universe, we are now uh, uh, when the universe was 300,000 years old, okay? The combination. So I mean, what happens at the combination is that basically electrons and protons combine to form neutral hydrogen, okay? Fine. This is something I want. Yes. I mean, I don't want you to keep all these uh, equations in, in your mind because I mean, I'm sure you won't need them. But you, I know, I want you to to to, to keep this in mind. Okay. So I mean, uh, you can work out again how the combination happens. You see, I mean, this is so simple. It's always the same equation applied to different reactions. But I mean, cosmology is not, it's not so difficult at the end. I mean, so you can see the Boltzmann equation here, right? And how do we apply this now to these reactions here? Electron proton giving a, a hydrogen plus, a neutral hydrogen plus a photon. Okay, so uh, the universe neutrality ensures this, and we define this free electron fraction, okay? And then we, we, the, the, num the number of photons. Uh, at equilibrium and, and at not equilibrium, let's say it's the same, okay? So here we can simplify this equation and get the evolution of the free electron fraction, okay? And what I want you to remind here is that 
what matters is the recombination rate to n equal to because the combination rate to any the 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 recombination rate to n equal one is irrelevant because each time that it 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 use it, it, it a, a hydrogen atom is formed a high energy photon will ionize it okay so free electron fraction as a function of the scale factor okay early universe there late universe here so we are going from a complete ionized universe to a complete uh, universe in which the, the electron fraction is basically the free electron fraction is zero because the, the electrons are tightly coupled to, to protons now from uh, neutral hydrogen okay as a function of the redshift and this happens at a redshift of thousand or so okay when the universe was three hundred thousand years very good and right after the combination we have the so-called cmb period okay the cmb period it's called cmb right or it's also known as as a photon decoupling because photons start to be freely travel in the universe without interacting with matter okay because now the matter is 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 in, is in form of neutral atoms okay and the cmb is frozen okay so um how to compute the photon decoupling just when the when the when the uh, when the thermal uh, uh, rate right equals the the this is the Thomson cross section equals the expansion rate of the universe and you can see that the residue of which uh, the coupling takes places is, is it takes place is roughly thousand right after uh, the combination period okay so photon decoupling cmb thousand uh, thousand and basically three hundred thousand years so let's continue with what happened here now at the CMB, at the CMB period, okay? So we have gone from BBN to the CMB period. So the cosmic magnetic background radiation, we are 300,000 years old. So this is a beautiful map, right? This is an image from, from, uh, from uh, Planck, okay? So you can see that this image is for 30.046 uh, um, uh, neutrinos that the precise number is 3.044 but okay so anyway and uh, here i saw you right uh, uh, how this is uh, this is computed so we have many many multiples right so you see we are summing over plus l equal 20 plus l equal 50 plus l equal 100 okay so here we have this beautiful image plus l equal 500 right so what is the cmb the CMB is just the temperature, right? Fluctuations decompose in terms of spherical harmonics, okay? So the expansion coefficients are given by these ALMs, right? So the power spectrum that we always see is just the variance, right? Of these, of these, of these, uh, of these um, uh, um, expansion coefficients, okay? In this, in this spherical harmonic decomposition, okay? Because a sort of theorem is a sort of theorem is that any function which is defined on a sphere can be decomposed in terms of spherical harmonics. Okay, so when you are looking, for instance, to L equal four, you are summing over these four maps here. Okay, these four, these four maps here. Okay, so just to give you an idea, we are decomposing in spherical harmonics the maps, and then we are summing over them. Okay. So I'm sure you have seen this many, many times, right? So this is the power spectrum that I just explained you how it extends from the maps, right? We are measuring temperature, the temperature in the sky and we are projecting it in, in spherical harmonics, right? So here I show you the power spectrum was measured by Planck, right? You see the error bars, they are tiny, 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 tiny. And uh, the, in, in, in the upper plot. And here I show you with this, uh, with this uh, red uh, curve, the predictions within a lambda CDN universe. That is a universe with colder matter, roughly 25%, uh, 5% variance, and 70% dark energy. So you see that the lambda CDN universe provides an X is to, 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 to current observation. And this here are the deviations of the data with respect to the, with respect to the best fit model, right? You can see that, I mean, they, they are perfectly consistent with, with error bars, okay? So there are a lot of information in this plot. So the largest modes, right, which are here at the lowest uh, uh, multiple, these are modes as large as, the, as, the, as, the, as our universe. That's why the errors are so large, okay? This is the so-called cosmic variance because we have only one universe. 
So there are modes that we can measure only once, okay? So I mean, so this will tell us about initial conditions, why? Because these modes were outside the horizon at, at the combination, okay? They have entered the horizon later on. So then they tell us about inflation, the initial conditions in the universe, okay? The people who are interested in inflation, how do we measure, uh, how do are we sensitive to, to inflation? In, just yes, because these modes here have not been, I can't believe it. Someone is calling me another, okay, so. Anyways, one second. Angela, te llamo nuevo luego que estoy dando okay? So, she's the, she's the, she's the, 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 the journalist of the OPP. So, I'm, I'm the outreach coordinator. And we are in, in the middle of organizing a theater, I mean, some theater for kids. And I mean, the theater now is closed because there was some fire. And I don't know. <laughs> and we don't know now what to do it. So anyway, so, uh, so this will tell us about initial conditions, OK? In the unit. The first thing, the first thing will tell us, yes. I'm just wondering about the outliers on the right. The what, the what? The outliers, or are they? Ah, well, yeah, I mean, these are just, uh, you know, I mean, look, they say fluctuations here, but I mean, uh, I don't know why this is but like this. What know, does it represent way. on the bottom? Because I would expect to see something weird on the no, top no, I don't plot. Think, I, I think that this is extremely weird because I don't see this here in the data. So I mean, sorry? Hmm. I mean. But I no, I mean the, the, the problem is here. I mean, if, if any, if any, if there is any any issue, people are always like focusing in this in this bit here, but not in this in this high region. Or because moreover, this region has been measured also by SPP and by uh, as now I'm gonna explain. And no, nothing nothing fancy is going on there, I believe. Unfortunately, so so this. Uh, I assume that's because like semantics error is much smaller than the size of the point. Probably, yeah. I so, mean, but yeah. Uh, there is nothing fancy. So I mean, the first thing will tell us about the geometry of the universe. Okay, so that is flat. The location of this peak at this multiple is telling us that the universe is flat, and also about the the mass of the neutrino as we will see. Okay, and then second peak is the so-called avarian meter. Okay, because I mean. The second peak, uh, as I explained, you right, uh, uh, variance are in the gravitational potential waves, right? So, uh, as 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 the as the as the um, uh, number density of variance changes, okay, it changes the relative height of this peak with respect to the first one, okay? So we are measured with, with really explicit precision omega b h squared from the second peak, okay? And the larger and the higher uh, the higher uh, peaks will be sensitive to NFT, okay? These peaks are those that are gonna tell us about NFT. Well, here is a two maps, one for uh, three neutrinos and another one for six. So, I mean, <laughs> do you see any differences? <laughs> I so, I don't know. I mean, I put a mask on No way, no way, however, if I do like this, now you will tell me, oh, of course, I mean, uh, NFP, CMB can measure this because I mean, the differences are very, very large and much larger than the error bars, okay? So, it's elementary Maria question. Okay, so um, realize that unfortunately, we are not only measuring any, the, the number of red neutrinos, okay, we are measuring the baryon density, the matter density, the Hubble parameter, the amplitude of the primordial spectrum, the, the tilt of the primordial spectrum, the optical reionization depth, and moreover, NFT. So, uh, warning, <laughs> warning, warning, because I can change some of these parameters, right? And then I will get here, right? So you can neither distinguish this red line that I obtain here, red dash line that I also obtain here, I send you, I show you here the relative difference with, with respect to the case of an effective equal to They are basically the same. So it's not elementary at all. What happens is that um, at the multiples measured by WMAP and Planck below 1,000, okay, below 1,000, that in that region, the only effect that that can mimic by other is the anisotropic, is the neutrino anisotropic effect around the 30. So, I mean, at low multiples, 
the only way of measuring an effective is via the neutrino isotopic field. So, and this is because neutrinos are free spinning particles and they are traveling at the speed of light, faster than the sound speed at horizon. And they suppress the oscillation modes entering the horizon in the radiation period, okay? So, this is the only effect that cannot limit my limit my errors, okay? Around the 30. So, if instead we go to the uh, high multiple region, as measured by the South Pole Telescope, okay, and the, by the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, a higher and effective, right, will increase the expansion rate and also the damping at high multiples, okay? And here I show you, right, the damping length. So you can clearly see here, right, how, let me show you this, right, how a higher and effective will decrease the, 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 the height of this high, uh, the, the, the height of this high multiple fits. And that's why we learn about an effective in the CMB. In these peaks, in these high multiple peaks, above 1,000, below 1,000, no, because there are plenty of the genesis, okay? We cannot understand much about, about an effective at low, at low peaks, okay? So the only the genesis then, we, we, together, uh, that has an effective uh, uh, from the point of view of the CMB is with the helium abundance, okay? So here I show you the predictions from BBM plus CMB, right? For the helium, right? For the deuterium, right? And for, um, um, sorry, and from also from astronomical uh, 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 measurements and from CMB uh, helium determination, right? So CMB plus CMB. When I fix the number of neutrinos to fix, okay? So what's the difference between this plot and this, and this one? In this one, I'm not fixing, right? The number of neutrinos, right? So I'm combining Planck with BBM measurements. And I'm not fixing a new here. As you can see, the largest error will be in the helium component, right? Which, as I told you, is the only one which is sensitive to an effective. The deuterium does not care if an effective is, is fixed or not. And in the error, I can measure very well the deuterium, right? Look at this in, in, in the magenta lines, right? Regardless, right? Whatever I assume about an effective. However, the helium, have you seen how much it changes, right? I mean, from this magenta line, right, we go to this huge magenta region, okay? Because what happens is that at high multiples, right, the damping of the high multiples is, is, is produced by an effective, but also by the helium component. So there is a still a little mm -hmm. degeneracy at high multiples between an effective and Helium and the helium component, but the helium, we can measure it also via uh, astronomical observations, right? So there is a hope for that, okay? So even if at high multiple, there is still a, a little degeneracy between the helium component and an effective, by measuring helium with, astronomic, with, with astronomical measurements, this degeneracy gets less, okay? But at low multiples, there is no way because it's, there are plenty of degeneracies, okay? So this is the most important message, okay? Numbers, 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 numbers. Bad luck for a sterile neutrino physicist or for whatever, right? Because, I mean, flat and boring also. I mean, to be realistic, quite boring, right? Because an effective uh, is uh, 2.09 plus minus uh, 0.36, basically at 95% confidence level. And if we are large scale structure information in the bio safe form, that I will explain you what it is, we get a number that is super close to three. So little room for, for a sterile or additional species, okay? From median plus, plus a CMB. And moreover, these measurements from the CMB are perfectly consistent with BBM estimates. You can see here helium, deuterium, and here BBM, and they agree perfectly. So no way. Here an effective is equal three, and here a, a lot of possible combinations and models Lambda CDM plus an effective, lambda CDM plus an effective plus run, plus running of the of the scalar spectral index. You can see right that there is not much hope for models uh, extending an effective different from three, at least in the minimal lambda CDM model. And also, even if we add some extensions, it's quite difficult. Okay. So the future is brilliant. We have the CMB, the, we will have the Simons Observatory and the CMB stage for measurements. So here I show you in the, in the plane of the helium and an effective um, 
in, in, in the NF, uh, Kilman NFT play, the current constraints on Planck, okay? Okay, and the expectation. So we are gonna really, really, really decrease the errors on, 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 on NFT from future observations of the CMB as those that will be carried out by the Simons Observatory, Observatory and CMB explorer. Okay, here I show you also, right, the current, the status, and the future one. The, 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 these bar, these, these lines, the, the, the ones that are not contours are DBN predictions. And then look at how this, the size of these of this contours will change, right, from now to the future. Okay, so you can see, right, this is Planck now. This is uh, 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 CMB stage four, right? See the, see the size of this, of this, of this contour, right? The, in the neutrino number, right? You can see that the errors will be, will be really, really tiny. And the future observations of, of not only of the CMB, but combined with the other uh, large scale structure stuff, will even be able maybe to test this 0.044 theoretical prediction right this will be amazing imagine you will be able to test this this is tiny tiny deviation from three okay from future uh, probes okay so um this is something that you want to play with yes yeah do we understand like physically why changing an effective affects this damping in the CMB? Like, yeah, sure, what, sure. Yeah, okay. Going... So let me let, let me let me go back uh, a little bit. How can I go back? So uh, without making any mess. Uh, that's difficult. <laughs> yeah. So ah, like this. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> You see, my husband. Yeah, after that, the yeah, yeah, experimentalist theories. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I mean. Well, I, I went back too much, so I will, okay, uh, no problem. So, I mean, yeah, let me, let me, wait one second, this was. Oh, sorry, I should have asked. No problem, no problem, no problem. I'm a theorist, you see, so I mean, <laughs> there is no way to, to improve this now. Okay, so, uh, just one minute. Okay, so. The CMB, then you remember this. So. Okay, now we are the diffusion. Uh, and I was explaining you that uh, this is not easy. Here I'm in with my magnifying glasses. Okay, here I went to yeah. Here is the, 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 the low L region where you cannot measure it. And now let's go to the high L region, right? As measured by the Atacama cosmology. This, uh, this is Planck, this is WMAP flying there, very good. No, this is the map and this is plan. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. For the future director of the NASA, look at the <laughs> pictures. <of this. laughs> okay. So here we are. So I mean, yeah. Uh, here, this is the South Pole Telescope, Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Here we are. So I mean, what happened is that if if I increase an effective, right? H will increase, right? It will increase, and then these modes will be more damp. Okay, the diffusion length, the the, the 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 diffusion length here is increased, right? So I mean, there will be more damping, right? Indeed, if I change if I change the, the diffusion damping here, I can compensate the effect. So comes from this formula, okay? But realize that in that formula, n e is x e times one minus y p. So that's why this is the helium about that. That's why helium and an effective are they generate at the high multiples because I can I can also produce a damping by changing the helium component. Okay, that's why. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. You are welcome. It's the diffusion of photons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the photon diffusion. Uh, um, yeah, before recombination. Yeah. Hola, Olga. Uh, I just want to know if this 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 effective number of neutrino is left-handed neutrino or also they are counting right-handed neutrinos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the number of neutrinos. Uh, I mean, uh, forget about. I mean, it's the number of left-handed neutrinos. If you want, because neutrino. at this time, the, I mean, at this time, neutrinos are relativistic. I mean, if they are relativistic, you cannot distinguish never ever major and after daylight. If you are thinking. About no, no. I'm thinking about left-handed. Uh, neutrinos or right-handed neutrinos? Left-handed ones, I mean, you know I mean? Active so. neutrinos. Yeah. 
I mean, the number of neutrinos that is equal to the number of antineutrinos. So, I mean, don't think about, I mean, how can I say? It? I mean, differences between uh, left and right uh, chirality, let's mm -hmm. say, you can only do it when, when, when there is a mass, right? I mean, when there is no mass, you can always, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Then it doesn't exclude some sort of hypothetical, very, very heavy neutral left and right. Yeah, I mean, these are these are relativistic at the Exactly. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. These are relativistic at the coupling, okay? So, I mean, this is something I didn't say. From what I'm going to say, well, I should have said that. From what I'm going to say today, there won't be any difference for the Iraq and and neutrinos, okay? Difference for the Iraq and neutrinos arise when they are non-relativistic. I mean, so there is this photolemy proposal that afterwards, if you want in the discussion, we can talk about that. And apparently, it could have some sensitive to that. But, you know, it's because neutrinos are mass, mass effects are important. Otherwise, here the neutrino mass is the is a relativistic degrees of freedom. Okay. So, this is in case you want to play with this, but let's move now to neutrino masses. So, and, um, and the CMB. Okay. So we have seen, again, we are here, we didn't move in the cosmic uh, trip, okay? We are still there. Okay, so what, what's going on with the CMB and with the neutrino masses? So here I show you, okay, the effect of the neutrino masses on the multiple. This is the very same uh, plot that we have seen, but I show you here the predictions for if we had a 2 EV neutrino mass, a 1 EV neutrino mass, and 0.5 EV neutrino mass. So you can see clearly that there is a, reduction in the height of the first peak, and then a shift towards smaller scales. So, sorry, smaller uh, multiples, larger scales, okay? Larger angular scales. You can see it clearly, right? So, I mean, um, the first one is the so-called Sachs wall effect, okay? And here I show you the temperature fluctuations, and they have different contributions. One is the primordial one, the initial one, the one set by inflation. Then we have the gravitational potential contribution, the Doppler effect, and this term here. This term is the so-called integrated Sachs wall effect. So what, what happens is that this effect will be present only if neutrinos are relativistic. Otherwise, it won't happen because it depends on the time derivatives of the gravitational potentials, okay? And the gravitational potentials are constant in matter-dominated matter universe, okay? So the transition from the relativistic to the non-relativistic neutrino regime, that's imprinted here in the decays of the gravitational potentials, contributing to the ISW effect. The ISW effect is not very large. I mean, it's just here, this is, is the ISW effect is this, and it is like here, right? But still, it contributes, it, it, it's maximal around the first peak, and then this is the deflation that, that will induce in the, in, the, in the first peak, okay? So a neutrino mass of one EV will, will induce a 10% a uh, uh, deflation of the first peak, which is not much, but still is how do we infer the neutrino mass from the, from the CMB, okay? By its effect on, on the first peak, okay? You can see this here again, the ISW effect, and as I increase the neutrino mass, it goes down and down and down, okay? The first peak. The second one is a shift towards a, a, a smaller a multiple, that is larger angular scales, okay? And larger also scales. So uh, the, the angular location of the peaks is given by the sound horizon and recombination, which is the, the distance that a sound wave can travel in the universe since the beginning is from the universe until the combination, okay? Divided by the angular diameter distance, which is the distance from us, to the, to the last scattering surface, okay? This ratio, this determines the angular location of the peaks. So, I mean, the higher the neutrino mass, the higher uh, H of C and the lower the angular diameter distance. If I lower the angular diameter distance, theta will be uh, high, uh, lower, sorry. So, I mean, peaks will seek to lower multiples. Let's see if I get this, if I said this correctly, because I think that I made uh, some. So, the higher the neutrino mass, the lower is this, okay? The lower is this, the higher is theta. Larger angular scales. Larger angular scales are that way, okay? Smaller rates, okay? They are other. 
larger uh, angular scale, that's why the error bars are so, so, so large, and here are smaller small scales, okay? But you will tell me, oh, very good, but then I can do the same, because here I have the Hubble constant, and then there is a strong degeneration. So, I mean, I increase the new, I mean, I change the Hubble constant, and that's it. So what happens is that these two effects are cancelled because there are parameter degenerations. So then you will tell me, yeah, but I mean, Planck puts limits on the neutrino mass, right? I mean, we have seen that in the Planck paper. <laughs> okay. How does, does it do it with the gravitational lensing? You know, right, that Einstein relativity predicts that the presence of a massive body will put the space time and distorting the light trajectory. The objects will be multiplied, magnified, distorted, okay, by the presence of matter in homogeneities between us and the last step on the surface. Can I show you a beautiful thing? This is a this is this is just a parenthesis. This is um, a movie in which we have a lensing galaxy and behind a um, a background quasar, a quasar uh, it's, it's something that is emitting light, and you will see right the lensing. Image. So the quasar is moving behind the galaxy, and you will see you will see here the lensing. Image. So when the alignment between the the, 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 the background source, the galaxy, and us is perfect. Instead of observing just one thing, we are observing a perfect thing. These are the so called Einstein rates, okay? So it's amazing. And uh, the most amazing thing is that we have observed a double Einstein ring. Imagine, have you seen this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope? You can see here an inner Einstein ring and an outer Einstein ring. There are uh, less than 100 cases in the universe, in all the universe, right? And we are seeing one. So we have three perfectly aligned galaxies plus us. Observing. Okay, let's come back to the CMB. So as in the case of, of uh, I mean, the, the CMB photons, as any other sort of light, will be also distorted by the presence of matter in homogeneities, okay? Between us and the last star. And what happens is that lensing produces a remapping of the CMB fluctuation. The lensing potential, it's a measure of the integrated mass distribution back to the last scattering surface. This is the lensing potential. And measures both the matter distribution and also the geometry. Okay. So this is the power spectrum of the of the of the of the of the, of the lensing potential. Okay. And the most important thing I want to show you here is that neutrinos are hot dark matter. They don't cluster at a small scale. So they reduce lensing. Okay, they reduce lensing. They reduce lensing on a small scale. You can see here the derivative of the lensing uh, power spectrum. And you can see that as the neutrino mass is increased, it's, it's greatly reduced, right? I mean, the effect is quite big. So uh, let me show you this. Uh, here, you can see, this is a, a plot from the plan collaboration of the, uh, in 2013. You can see that as dark uh, reddish colors are higher neutrino masses, as the neutrino masses increase, the lensing power spectrum is reduced. Okay, this is how we measure and how Planck measures the neutrino mass via a uh, lensing measurement. So Planck is able to set a limit on the neutrino mass combining temperature polarization and lensing measurement of 0.24 eV at 95% confidence level. And here I show you this limit in terms of this plot that, uh, that we have seen already many times, right? That this, uh, which uh, is uh, in the y-axis has the sum of the neutrino, the three neutrino masses, and here we have them versus the mass of the lightest neutrino. The mass of the lightest neutrino could be even zero, okay? For the normal in red and for the blue, uh, in, uh, and for the inverted in blue, okay? So this is the limit that Planck puts, okay? And what this implies is that six million neutrinos can weigh more than three electrons, okay? This is the limit that, that Planck says, okay? That six million neutrinos can weigh more than three electrons. This 0.24 uh, okay? Very good. But by far, and by far I mean by far, the largest effect of neutrino masses is that induced on the large scale structure of the universe, okay? So we are now when the edge of the universe is of the order of giga years, okay? We are now entering in the large scale structure formation. And it's because neutrinos are hot dark matter with very large thermal velocities. So they suppress a structure formation. Cold dark matter instead has zero velocity and therefore clusters at any scale. So let me explain you this. Neutrinos will have something associated that is called the so-called that is the so-called free spinning scale. Okay. So 
if the wavelength of the perturbation of the gravitational potential well is smaller than the free spinning scale, neutrinos won't cluster, okay? Won't cluster. They won't fail in the gravitational potential well. Colder matter always is there because it has zero velocities, okay? However, if the opposite patterns, of course, neutrinos will continue to cluster, okay? Fine. So you will tell me, but what is this free streaming scale? I'll explain you now. Here I saw your super nice movie. That is one of my students or former students. In which you can see how are the cosmologies in a, how are the how are uh, how large scale structure looks like, sorry, in a neutrino cosmology, in a dharma, in a dharma, colder matter cosmology, and together. You have seen that here there is no basically no no sorry. There is no um Let's come back. So there is no small scale structure basically, right? While here there, there, there is way more like structure at small scales. Here is, is, is if I combine them, okay? So I mean realize that by measuring smaller scales, we can tell us about we can tell about uh, how big is the neutrino contribution, okay? So this is very important, the effect and the different these these are simulations, okay? These are the results of embodied simulations, okay? This is uh, from, from Francisco Villescu Navarro. Uh, so, what is this free streaming scale? Okay, so how do we compute the growth of a structure in cosmology? With this equation in the linear regime, of course. It's just a differential equation, right? And if we have a, a fluid with constant sound speed, it's as easy as this, okay? So, delta is the perturbation, okay, that is going to grow. Or not, depending, right? If the universe is expanding in a transfigurated way, it won't grow. So we have different terms in this equation. The first one, this one, the one that goes with the derivative is the Hubble parameter, is the Hubble drag, which of course the expansion of the universe prevents clamping. Okay. Then we have the, the pressure, which is or which also will prevent clamping in clamping, and then we have gravity, which of, of course favors clamping. Okay. So the free streaming scale, or in terms of the of the uh, wave number, is just defined as the pressure, as, as the value of, of, of the scale, in this case, k, at which if k is larger than this mean scale, right, no growth can happen because pressure is stronger than gravity, okay? But if the opposite happens, structure grows. So I mean, the neutrino free streaming scale is just the gene scale, but instead of having here, right, this, this is just H of C, right, if you just uh, do some, some basic math, right, instead of having here Cs squared, we have the neutrino disp uh, dispersion velocity, okay, and here is just that 3H squared, right, is equal to A pi J rho, okay, this is what, right, I mean, so just this, you know, there is a 4, 8, just this, okay. So when you when they tell you about this neutrino free streaming scale, it's just as simple as this. I mean, it's the gene scale. It's just when gravity is all I told you yesterday. It's all a game between gravity and and it's a, it's a game between gravity and pressure. So I mean, depending on what uh, dominant structure will grow or not. Okay. So this is something that you need to compute. This is one exercise you will have to do this afternoon, just to go from this expression to this expression. And believe me, that is all units, although it's a mess of units, of course, because you have kiloparsecs, megaparsecs, MEVs, GEVs, whatever, everything together, right? So, but you will be able to do that. This is a movie in which I show you how they look at this. This is the matter power spectrum, okay, as measured by the, by the this is the, the, the Fourier transform of the two point galaxy correlation function, okay? We measure galaxies in the sky and then we measure how many galaxies are surrounding a given one and then we do the, 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 the Fourier transform. It's just this. So as I increase the neutrino mass, you see, right, that there is a huge reduction. So the reduction, right, is much, much higher than in the CMB. Realize that in the CMB, one EV neutrino was producing a reduction of 10%. Here, one, we, one EV neutrino will produce a reduction of 100% in the linear regime. So, I mean, the reduction in the power spectrum induced by neutrino masses is huge, it's incredibly large, okay? And this is how we are measuring neutrino masses from cosmology, mostly. 
due to the effect on large scale extraction. Okay. However, things are not as good and as nice, of course, because you know uh, we know how to compute things in the CMB. Everything is linear. Everything is great. But then, in large scales, we when we start to compute things in the non-linear regime, we start to have problems predicting the power spectrum here. So I mean. And uh, you see here the effect in the power spectrum, the, 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 the large, it appears precisely at the scales at which nonlinear physics, right, governing the growth of perturbations in the universe starts to operate. And this is one of the difficulties we have, right, when measuring neutrino masses from uh, large scale structure. We need very, very uh, accurate nonlinear calculations, okay? And because there is a scale above which, right here, you see the cyan line here, above which nonlinear corrections are important. These are measurements from the from the from the um, uh, boss. I will say, boss is a, a digital survey, a data release nine and data release twelve, right? And you can see how there is a scale at which linear is the linear uh, the nonlinear uh, matter power starts to be important okay another uh so i mean the linear perturbation theory will break down and another issue is here right there another issue i would like to to uh, also to tell you and now i will finish with this and we will we'll continue tomorrow is that huh, the second caveat is that we are not measuring uh, the, mat the dark matter we are measuring galaxies and galaxies are bias bias traces of the underlying matter density okay and neutrinos themselves induce a bias uh, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the matter power spectrum. So, you know what I mean, right? I mean, that what we are measuring is the galaxy galaxy power spectrum, not the dark matter power spectrum. And they are related via a bias, right? And the bias depends on the type of galaxies, of course, right? So all the galaxies have, 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 have different biases than, 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 than newer galaxies, let's say, okay? So, I mean, we have to account for this uh, bias effect when measuring, when extracting neutrinos masses from cosmology. It's not as easy as, okay, look at the separation, then it's fine, perfect. No, we are measuring galaxies. There are predictions at, large, at small scales, nonlinear predictions that we are not so able to measure properly, but we'll solve them with variant acoustic oscillations. And here I stop, okay? So, tomorrow we'll see. Uh, large scale, we will continue uh, with large scale structure, okay? Looking at variant acoustic oscillations. And then, I mean, you, you will have to tell me, you prefer more, like, I tell you more about uh, SKA, radio telescopes, and, and, and neutrino masses, and, and neutrino mass hierarchy, sorry, measurements, inverted normal with cosmology, that is going to be fun because we are fighting against each other since long ago. And I will tell you all the chicha. All the, <laughs> the rumors, but also I can tell you a bit about the Hubble constant um, tension that is also super, super uh, uh, fashion, right? I mean, so let's see tomorrow you will tell me what you, would you prefer, depending on your feelings. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we do a poll, like, okay. <laughs> but first we will finish about explaining you this beautiful movie here, what are about acoustic oscillations, you see, and in this sound wave that stops. But I will I will explain you this tomorrow. I mean, because large scale structure observations can either interpret it in the geometrical form, that is with the power spectrum, with the or with the baryon acoustic oscillation signature. Okay. And baryon acoustic oscillations are better because they are less subject to nonlinearities, okay, are somehow a stronger, uh, more reliable stuff. Because the other ones, we have the, the, the measurements of the power spectrum, we have seen that there is a scale at which nonlinear physics start to operate and it's difficult to make predictions there. We rely on cosmological simulations. But what happens with cosmological simulations is that they are becoming so huge, the, 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 the surveys, right? That I mean, even to, to, to do simulation for the largest modes, is super difficult because I mean they, they are most larger than the size of the volume of the of the of the observation, right? So I mean, anyway. So now you are hungry and uh, I stop talking. And if you have questions and uh, or also in the in the in the discussion or are now at lunch time or whatever, okay? <laughs> okay.
further. Um, yeah, do we have more questions? We are right hungry, excited. <laughs> yeah, but as I said, we also have time later. To yeah, talk yeah, about sure. This. And for the exercises that are yeah. super easy compared to the ones I saw yesterday, they are super easy. <laughs> Come on. The ones of yesterday was sweaty, like, don't ask me. I'm so going. I have a meeting. <laughs> okay. I had a meeting with you. Eh? <laughs> Okay, I also made some printouts for the exercises if you want to pick, pick this up during the break. Otherwise, let's have the lunch break now and yeah, we'll come yeah. back at uh, 1.30 and let's for thank the, for Olga again okay. for her lecture. <laughs> So everyone on Zoom, we are coming back at 1.30 yeah. with uh, a seminar. They are super easy. You will do them in half an hour. Yes. If you want to have lunch, I won't stop you. But could you maybe explain me again, like the bias of the power yeah, spectrum? Yeah. I mean, I understand we measure galaxies when we measure like, the power yeah, spectrum. Yeah, and then what happens is that galaxies cluster different. Depending on the type yeah. of galaxy, depending on whether they form, they cluster in a different way in the gravitational force. Okay, like the, the normal matter cluster. Exactly. So, I mean, let's see. If this is the matter power.